Welcome. This is the May 22nd OpenZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Dan, Stu, Greg, Alexander, and myself. And on yesterday's leadership call, Alexander gave a good overview of the multi-gen LRU issues he's hitting. It seems that traditionally ZFS has occasionally had to lie to any given kernel, and he found a bit of a oh pathological situation where the arc gets rapidly evicted and you start swapping like crazy. So I think there were proposals of like maybe changing the default pages. I'm just scanning my own notes here, but uh, Mav, if that's accurate, great. If not, please do fill us in and if you have any news, please share it. Um, yeah, uh, there was difficult relations between this Linux kernel and ZFS. And uh, as, as you've told, ZFS indeed lies to kernel about how, how much memory it can free, because if not lie, different memory, uh, different kernel version tend to behave differently, and some of them indeed tend to request huge amount of memory to be freed. And uh, we found with later up, latest update uh, to 6.6 .6 LTS kernel that new multi-gen LRU code may tend to first try to evict a lot of memory from page cache, which ends up in heavy swapping. And after that, it tends to also request ARC to drop like half, quarter, or whatever, huge portions of ARC, which doesn't end up good. Well, it's like if ARC, if ZFS lies, then it end up, ends up okay, but then it's circular lie. Uh, kernel doesn't look what ZFS can free and tries to free more, and then ZFS survives only because it is lying. <laughs> so hmm, that's, that's not a like an infinite loop of permanent lies. That's not exactly clear how to get out of this mess. Uh, so yeah, in TrueNAS we disabled for now this uh, multi-gen LRU, and uh, that should help with swapping issue. Pe many people reported. But I, I worry that by the end of the year, old code or at some point, the old code may get dropped as soon as they decide that new code is stable. Uh, so it's still hard to say how to make ZFS interoperate with Linux kernel properly. Uh, at least previous code before multi general RU was, it was still unaware of ZFS, but at least it was trying to free memory in iterations. And so it, that way it balances free memory between page cache and ZFS. It just asked each of them in one, uh, one after another in a loop, give more, give more, give more until it gets enough. But new code so that multi general you tries to free all memory it needs in one go. So it first tries to do all by dropping page cache. When that appears not enough, it asks ZFS to, to again free everything. I reported the, that issue to the multi-gen LRU developer, and he confirmed that uh, his relation to shrinker interface that's used by ZFS is wrong, and proposed a patch, but that patch didn't fix swapping, so I don't know where it will end up at the end. Hopefully, he will think more about it, but I haven't heard more after that from him. Was there a motivation for the original changes in the multi-gen LRU code? What were they solving by changing that? Uh, they were trying, like, trying to reduce memory allocation latency. Okay. Because our previous code doing multiple iterations, it spent a lot of time trying to free memory from different sources. While new code tries to directly estimate how much memory could be reasonably freed from page cache and drop it in one go. The ah. problem is that uh, on, on any self-respecting NAS system, Page cache is non significant minority, and you can't <laughs> get mem much memory out of it. And they are not designed for that situation. So, welcome. Yeah. This is similar to a generational <laughs> garbage collector uh, and the infant mort mortality you can exploit. Mm, I, honestly, I haven't looked on what exactly those generations. I suppose it's just a way to drag, track hot cold pages just uh, in not uh, in a hot versus cold but in more in more 
steps, but honestly, I haven't looked. I may be wrong. I, that wasn't my call to look deep there. But And Stu, have you bumped into this on your platform? Or is that kernel too new for you? That is the next kernel we're going to be testing. So <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> because, yeah, uh, heads up. Okay. Well, uh, it sounds like this, you're tracking that. Go ahead, Jan. Is this just a future development, or has any of that made it into 2.2.4? What development? Sorry. Are they backporting this? Is that what you mean? Or in, in OpenZFS? I, about the uh, memory leak? Or I guess the allocator, Jan, is that what you're referring to? Yes. Um, with the, with the, does anyone of that affect non Linux platforms? Is there anything to watch out for there? Oh, the, that that multi -gen, multi gen stuff is clearly all Linux. Uh, it's uh, it, 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 it's not applicable to FreeBSD in any way. Uh, FreeBSD has different implementation, and uh, hopefully it's kind of uh, closer to what Linux did originally with multiple iterations. So it it works acceptably well. I was just, just you, you mentioned patch just uh, yesterday. Uh, speaking about FreeBSD, there was found memory leak uh, in ZFS. It's actually I caused it some time ago fixing uh, some other issue, and yesterday I pushed the patch. Uh, to fix that leak, it's one liner, but uh, since we are somewhere very close in 14.1 release cycle, we may, it seems like uh, risk engineering are not uh, happy to include it last moment. So we may release with, with that uh, memory leak, but then fix it with Serata notice in a short while. How aggressive is that leak? Like, uh, takes the hour, hours to find or months to find? Probably very much depend on workload. Uh, it should happen only in situation when you write something into ZFS from memory which is not uh, mapped uh, at the moment. Okay. I'm not sure how exactly that happened in production, but apparently, um, since people are reporting some leaks, it's probably it happens. Yeah. But how wide? Yeah. If we should use unmapped. Uh memory buffers anytime the block driver supports it, which is all the common SCSI and SATA controllers. No, no it's, it it's what... having to shoot down the mappings uh, anytime it, you change your allocations. It's it's different layer. It's uh, more a relation to a map. For example, uh, the reproduction Mark Johnson provided, uh, thanks to him, uh, it's you just create a map of something without it touching it, so it's uh, it's not present in memory, you try to write from that a map into ZFS. ZFS try to uh, access it, uh, see that it's not there, uh, return error, and then kernel maps those pages, repeat again to ZFS, but in the middle of that process, some allocations are leak leaked by ZFS. Oh, okay. So that's completely different from what I assumed it would, was about the BIO unmap. No, it, it's uh, not related to BIO unmap. No, it's it's about page fold during sorry, the not, writes. Uh, not, yeah, not BIO unmap. So that would be the trim support. You know what? Uh, the, the support in Amazon for having basically buffers which are in a range of address space, which is only valid on the specific CPU, so that you don't have to keep the page tables uh, synchronized between CPUs and, the, and validate the TLB. Uh, but that's apparently not it either, which is good to know, because otherwise it would be relevant to every decent search controller. No, it, it's not that. Uh, I don't know how people are producing in production. I think uh, I saw a report that some uh, build world uh, may leak a couple, couple blocks 
but I don't know why a couple, um, such a weird number. But somebody else reported that he managed to leak like 10 gigabyte. I don't know mm. just over how much, how long time. So it, it pr- probably it may depend. Uh, obviously we see, uh, I actually, uh, how, it's, how it is noticed, if you have uh, enabled debug kernels that attempt to reboot after that panics, science, ZFS can't free leaked memory. On attempt to unload the FS module, it panics. But if you hmm. have production kernel, obviously reboot will fix everything. It won't be noticed. Okay. Any other development topics, Alexander? Uh, uh, I have more questions for Alexander. Yes, I heard someone chime in. Um, we we um, often get Linux users telling us, "Hey, listen." This machine's always running out of swap. And why don't you just turn off swap and, and let the system just run out of memory? And that's Linux users on a free BSD host. And I'm wondering if the avoidance of using swap seems to be a Linux a Linux specific approach to out of memory situations, because we never encounter that suggestion from FreeBSD users. And I'm just one of the different approach. Nope. To I Actually, speaking to that uh, issue, I talked first about multi general RU. Disabling swap is the easiest way to fix the problem in production. It immediately solves the problem. Maybe not in the best way possible. Science, I guess, it will still heavily evict um, page back at file back at pages, but yeah. uh, it solves the problem. While no, uh, I don't really, I don't really like that approach. And even so, in next to us version, aside of disabling multi general you will also going to disable swap. That was against my recommendation. I don't <laughs> like that approach, but my, many people prefer having processes skillet instead of swapped. Uh, which yeah. Trina, scale core or both? Scale uh, Dragonfish.1. Okay. 24 or uh, 4.1. Okay. Uh, on on my... core, we, we saw it slightly tuned to use swap later, to not swap proactively. Science, otherwise, data lay on a swap, our arc grow, and after that, data that got into swap will stay there forever. So that's probably not. Uh, best behavior science at some point when we really need some memory after under some pressure data are already laying on a swap if they occupy all the swap we get out of swap and then processes get killed so we tune core you know, freebies diversion uh, to actually not swap until it's uh, really necessary do you know if um Trunas either core or scale uses proxy TL to uh, protect the important uh, middleware processes from uh, the out of memory killer? Or could it happen to you that their own management demons get killed? Uh, uh, there is ongoing investigation how and what to protect. Yeah, that's, I say it, we definitely should do at least that. But that's in progress. What syscontrols or otherwise will allow you to protect applications from being reaped by the out-of-memory protections? I think, Jan, you touched on that. and Alexander, On uh, FreeBSD, it's done via the proc control system call. uh, And there's a command line tool as well, which wraps some of the functionality of that system call. And I think on Linux, it's the same system call, just with different uh, magic constants you have to use uh, from a different header. It's every, okay. not sys, but Linux something to, but yeah. Same thing, basically. You have to have the permission to protect your address space up to a certain size from the out of memory killer. Cool. Or um, you can do something even more radical, that is to wire down all your memory, make make it completely unswappable, hmm. and touch every page once. But that's not 
the general do you not, purpose solution. Do you, not, do you not do that above a 2.3.26 kernel? Oh, no. you learned the hard way. That causes really doesn't like that. major hell. Yeah. You want to you want to talk in an infinite loop of mutual lies? Yeah. That thing yeah. will go absolutely bash it. So the problem at, on Linux is that they really, really don't like their swap because they had a broken swap for two decades or so. From a performance point of view, it was just very suboptimal even for swap. Uh, the right. if you're running logic anything, was just yeah, if you're running anything near real time, specifically encoding, the second it goes into swap, your encode is dead. Hmm. And the big problem so is weird. that um, because uh, processes are, uh, are so big when they fork, if you don't overcommit, you at that point in time have to find physical page frames to back all the the pages uh, of the child process, even if it immediately exacts into a tiny process, uh, unless you do a vfork uh, or POSIX spawn, which is often implemented with vfork. In my opinion, the same solution to not have to waste all of your time waiting to allocate memory only to immediately release it is to overcommit to the sum of swap and physical memory and then uh, get the performance optimization as long as you stay within RAM plus swap and everything works uh, and you only lose a few dozen gigabyte of flash. Uh, yeah, and that's not expensive and you get a system which can reasonably be overcommit uh, without ever getting caught in lies because it's only a performance lie it can get caught in, not a correctness lie. I, I, I'm surprised swap is still around. I mean, mem memory is cheap these days. Uh, I've been turning it off for years because yes no. yeah, we run we run a lot of jobs on the HPC. And if those jobs, especially the simulation jobs, if they go in the swap or our rendering time goes from 15 minutes up to several hours just because it's hit and swap. So um, by default, I've been disabled and swap for years. If the job needs more memory, then we just resubmit it to a, a, an appropriate host. That but, assumes that you are in a position to do that mm -hmm. on, a, let's say, a a graphics workstation, I would rather have the tank performance than crash uh, without saving. There's a difference between workstation level configuration, which I agree with. I have swap in my workstations, but in my production servers that are just running jobs, swap is off. Understandable, but yep. I hope you are then prepared to just suffer the out of memory killer. Uh, well, with that, you can. An uncanny aim at your most important uh, background processes. Yeah, but you can <laughs> configure the ARM killer to uh, favor processes. You can, you can mask processes to not be affected by it, right? And so, so we, we have, gel. yeah, yeah, we have worked around the problem. Um, it will definitely start killing things, but we made sure that that sends an alert, so we know that a, a machine's oh. under memory pressure. Or you could degrade gracefully by having a little bit of swap you normally really don't want to use. But let's say you're on your workstation, you spin up a virtual machine, and you really put the system on a high memory pressure. And for a few seconds, it has to page some things out, but everything will recover within seconds uh, to the normal throughput. But again, that goes back to workstation workflows versus Static workflows, server-based workflows. Di completely different mentality in my mind. I'm, I'm assuming Greg is similar in that because we we do the same workflows of processing content. And that, you know, if one asset starts taking five times longer because of a 10K hit to swap, I'd rather restart yeah. the same thing. Of course, if you have that kind of use case, it would totally throw off your K latency and wreck all your performance statistics and 
the more services you have talking to each other in a microservice like architecture, suddenly you're hitting your 99% percentile half the time because you're hitting so many API endpoints. And if you then have swap, and suddenly you swap is your expected per default performance and everything is horrible. But for something like a Pudia build server, I would rather you swap than not just because uh, I ran into a, a scheduling issue where it scheduled too many big jobs at the same time. I would rather have them suffer and the build server finish the repository build than just, sorry, uh, because of the way yep. the committers changed the ports tree, now you get to start again. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Let's try to keep it to ZFS in production. Go ahead, Greg. You unmuted, perhaps. No, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. House. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Any final yeah. thoughts on swap and ZFS systems? Just and beware of swap and the OOM because both can be really disruptive. Yes, sir. And I blew up my ARM system with tempfs, not realizing I'm burning the candle in like several places. Anyway, so arc swap, tempfs, all big scary demons. Let's see. Uh, Alexander yesterday, Pavel also mentioned uh, the new rate limiting feature in ZFS. Can you describe that for the group if you have a grasp on it? It's new to me. Oh. I, I saw a presentation of it on last OpenZFS uh, Dev Summit, but mm -hmm. I, I haven't had chance to look on on Pavel's patches. He asked me uh, to look on that, but I can't say much. But it's yeah. just idea of uh, <laughs> like a, as, it, as, it, as, it is, as it is told, resource limit throughput of read writes per data set hierarchical if you have several layers. You may specify who is allowed, what speeds. Oh, cool. Okay, that's a great description. Um, uh, and hence the hierarchical. Okay, uh, John, welcome. Do you have any topics? Same goes for Mark. You're muted for what it's worth, but maybe you're also stepping away. And to whom it may concern, there is a FreeBSD Enterprise Working Group meeting tomorrow, and I suppose all are welcome. I'll just drop that in. Uh, I'll put it in the chat here. But so it's in the yes, chat. please. Yes, there it is. Um, so who else has topics and? Uh, I wonder if even a topic like memory management at the user summit might be wise because on a modern system, you can, as I mentioned, burn that candle in several different places. Then I will think um, about Alex, it. Alexander, uh, did your um, ZVOL performance improvements make it into uh, FreeBSD 14.1, which includes OpenZFS 2.2.4? Yeah, I'm just trying to recall uh, which ZVOL improvements do you mean? Uh, something about uh, single threaded uh, write latency, if I remember it correctly, which is what I would care about. <laughs> Single-threaded write latency. There was a lot of zeal improvements uh, for some time ago, and those are all merged. Uh, the wall. Nice. The wall, I don't remember. There was significant the wall refactoring on Linux, but it wasn't ported on FreeBSD science, on FreeBSD, in, at least in all our workloads where we care about performance. We have uh, wall mode, dev, which bypass, which is practically all parallel. It doesn't need any task queues and so on. But if those, if there are people who use uh, vol mode not dev, yeah, there is potential space for improvement if uh, some code could be ported from Linux to FreeBSD to run 
uh, set of task use balance between them. Because right now FreeBSD in uh, the wall mode geo mode uses potentially only one thread per the wall. One, one task use per the wall. What would happen when you wrap the volume def with an uh, MD device? Or does uh, MD uh, config still refuse uh, to use V node mode for anything but normal files? M the wall around MD device, oh, MD device around the wall, and uh, what would be, what would it be? To turn it into a uh, GM provider by going through the MD driver. Hmm. Ah, no, then you wouldn't need the wall. You could put an MD on top of file. Uh, yeah, okay. That's not the truth. So the wall itself can be either uh, like GM provider or it can be almost like file just lying on DevFS, depending on your. Uh, Use case if you use gonna use it as a block layer through CTL or with with uh, Beehive as VM storage, you can switch it into wall mode dev, and then just Jerome will not care about it, and multiple threads of CTL will work directly and efficiently with it. And uh, we. No, in, in Trunas on Linux, we implemented right now the same behavior. It's uh, just there. Uh, it's a bit, a bit diff difficult to. You know, it's it's slightly different. So that's why it uses multiple may, may use their potential multiple task queue threads. It's slightly different designs, but some ideas from there could be ported to FreeBSD potentially. Cool. Other topics, especially those who have not said they don't have topics, if that makes sense. John, Mark. If not, I'm happy to call it. So speak now or forever hold your peace. Can I just and hold my peace until next week? Uh, go for it, but quite a few of us will be at BSD CAN. So our oh, well, okay, the week after on a mobile phone in a hallway, but that could also be fun. Um, then the week after. I mean, forever is a long time. Ha 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 ha. Just a, <laughs> just a week or two, I think, is probably more appropriate. Fair enough. Um, so I have. Go ahead, I have yep, I was. I have something that I could ask. I could probably figure it out on Google, but it's yeah, something I just noticed this morning when I came in. Um, so that file server that I have spoken about that we're using for uh, real-time playback of 4 and 8K, mm. um, it, it, it's been working fine for them uh, since I did my last round of tuning on it. Right. But uh, uh, that show has now completed, basically, so they're not doing reviews on it for the last week, I guess. Um, before, while it was being used, I had... Uh, uh, five or six um, four terabyte uh, NVMe cache drives recache um, and they're full uh, today I came in and I looked and they're like uh, less than half full so my, my question was or my curiosity was is there a timer that data that's been cached on those drives will will be expunged because I, I thought it would just sort of stay there until something else needed the space no, if you if you speak about L2R cache, then uh, there are two ways of eviction there. One is that uh, they're just cir circular reuse when something new is written, previous data is deleted. And the other way is if you delete something from your pool, uh, when some uh, and then Arc receives signals that some blocks are gonna be deleted, the data also can be deleted from L2R. Okay, so that must be it because we had a full file system on there for a while um, and we bought more storage and I was moving all the data off of it onto the new storage system. So I guess that data that I deleted was consuming space in the ARC, L2R. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Nice description. Go ahead, Jan. It's been a while since I really used uh, L2R uh, devices in anger. 
But back then it was an issue that basically you had to manually tune it to your exist workload and hardware uh, so that it wrote fast enough so that you basically caught the, the interesting parts as they get evicted from Arc and build the devices after a re uh, reboot in a reasonable time, but not so much that you uh, basically anger the firmware of SSDs. Is there any support in the L2 Arco to, to do something like a latency-based approach where, or a queue-length-based approach where you want to keep the queue short but not idle uh, when writing to L2 Arc or something like that, instead of having to do it indirectly by set setting the bandwidth throttle well, I'm not sure. I'm sure how much it depends on uh, make it drive not angry, but more I would worry about drive uh, life cycle. If you constantly write it twenty four seven at some high speed, yeah. you will wear out it pretty fast. Usually, L two arc devices are not very no, reliable. What I'm uh, worried about is if you pick a long term value, which is good for long term, it can take days or even weeks until the L two arc is warm again. Yeah, uh, that area definitely would be benefit from some love. Uh, at this point, uh, it's it has two speeds. Uh, one speed is before arc is full, another after arc is full. You can tune those separately. Uh, but I think okay, it okay. should be uh, I think it should be changed into uh, before L two arc is full and after L two arc is full. So before it is full, write faster. After it is full, go slower. That's one thing. And another thing, we could uh, look closer what exactly are we writing to l2 arc there is currently some uh, magic uh, there in a the code some logic to decide what to write and what not to or maybe in second priority but i believe uh, we could do more and uh, we could do better than we at the time now. i was using uh, two uh, bits per cell uh, flash for the l2 arc and yeah, with SATA, you have a short queue per device, and when you fill it up with writes, you can't schedule reads. So because of that, you have to keep a, the mixture right. And so I, I just assumed that it would be best to go by queue length and not by bandwidth. But, it, but yeah, you're right. It, it wears out flash quickly when you write a tweet with hundreds of megabytes per second, 24 by 7. Of course. But uh, that's, yeah. And 3D exponent is no more. Yeah. <laughs> John, uh, -Arc, uh, go ahead, and, uh, Alexander. Well, l 2 arc just uh, written uh, in a way to, like, it, it writes in batches of certain size. I don't remember how big is the batch. No, it's yes. actually, it's it's practically like one second batches. So it doesn't uh, control Q depths on, on precisely on level of l 2 arc code. <laughs> Only then maybe throttled on the level of VDFQ, uh, okay, but uh, but generally but generally it tries to write like one second it sent one second batch and then it uh, throttles to wait for a bit the second another second batch and then throttles. So sequential write should be easier for flash for controller to handle supposedly rather yes. than random or smaller. So I don't think that's the biggest problem, but maybe, yeah, it, maybe we could uh, tune those speeds better. Yeah, just uh, having a warm up rate until the L2 arc has hit a certain fill ratio, let's say 85% fill ratio or something, and then you go into steady state or something, mm -hmm. would probably already help so that you can have a, do it so fast that you don't. Uh, um, penalize uh, read latency uh, for the warm up phase and then a lifetime uh, of your flash uh, based read limit afterward once the flash is populated, uh, the cache is populated, would still require user uh, tuning, but not so much. Especially, wouldn't require changing the tuning value once the cache is. Has hit a certain fill rate because I just had a script uh, in etc rc dot local, which just probed once a minute how full the caches and then changed the CCTL 
over and that's not something you should have to hack into a system. Correct. Other topics? Ah, John, you briefly unmuted. You got something? Um, uh, no, I was here to be a fly on the wall. Then my computer oh. randomly died on me. I don't have oh. no idea why. So, Well, let's debug it. Now, um, anyway, other topics? Or shall we call it good, short, and sweet at about 38 minutes? I'm good. Well... You are making a decision for us. Thank you all. Like <laughs> and subscribe and uh, talk to you perhaps next week during BSD Can Entrenig can help co-moderate, but uh, we'll we'll play it by ear. Do you want to just cancel it for next week? I mean, that's... Um, uh, so a lot of these calls have evolved into like, I think we just set a record of a five-hour call just debugging things. So putting minds together can have fringe okay. benefits, even if not uh, recorded so the cadence is is pretty healthy uh, and your your participation is purely optional and I, I will reiterate that a secret to the calls is if you put a topic on the schedule there's a good chance if attractive it will get everyone's attention you'll see the answers in line maybe real time watching the doc or just in the recording after the fact when on the doc so uh, I, I prefer these be really really easy and accessible so uh, sure whatever works Nice. You guys have a good day. Take, Take care. care. Yeah. Maybe yeah, just right into the announcement that uh, lots of the participants will be at the BSD can uh, maybe uh, gain access to the hallway, maybe no content. <laughs> exactly. We'll see. And heck, if it's during the so, developer summit, well, that could be win-win. It's like, oh, we have a question from the audience. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.